Gaius Octavius was the son of the propraetor Gaius Octavius Furinus, who had served as governor of Macedonia in 60 BC following the dismissal of Antonius Hybrida. Hybrida, who was both uncle and father-in-law to Marcus Antonius, had been recalled to Rome, where he was tried for corruption, opening his position for the appointment of a replacement. The post was then filled by Octavius Furinus. Octavius's mother, Attia Balbusi Somia, was the daughter of Julius Caesar's sister. Octavius's father, before marrying Attia, had been married to a woman named Ancaria, by whom he had fathered a daughter named Octavia. He then became the father of a second daughter named Octavia, born to him and Caesar's niece in 66 BC. The birth of Gaius Octavius followed on September 23rd of the 63 BC year. Although Gaius Octavius was born on Palatine Hill, very close to the Forum Romanum, his father's people hailed from the countryside. The town of Velletri was approximately 27 miles southwest of Rome, and the Octavii were regarded as local gentry, with both streets and statues boasting their name. On the day Gaius Octavius was born, his father had other important business to memorialize the date, as it was on this very day that he was due in the Senate regarding the conspiracy of Lucius Sergius Catalina. Upon hearing the reason that Octavius Furinus was tardy, a senator named Publius Nigidius Figulus, likely congratulating him on the birth of a son, proclaimed that the ruler of the world has been born. While returning from his pro praetorship of Macedonia in order to stand for election as consul for the 58 BC year, the young Octavius's father fell ill. He never made it to Rome and died in the town of Nola, at his family's summer villa. As soon as Attia's mourning period ended, she married Lucius Martius Philippus, and the six-year-old Gaius Octavius gained a politically savvy stepfather to instruct him in the subtle ways of politics. Not only had Philippus's father backed the winning side in the civil war between the Marians and the Sullans, but his family could count among their achievements in government, consular standing as early as 306 BC, the censorship in 269 BC, and even the office of Magister Equitum, or Master of the Horse, to the dictator Nius Fulvius Maximus, in 263 BC. The wax funerary masks which decorated the atrium in the villa of Lucius Martius Philippus clearly told the story of his family. Political nuance was in their blood. And so, without a doubt, even Philippus's marriage to Attia was, at least in part, politically motivated. At the time of their marriage, the triumvirate of Julius Caesar, Pompeius Magnus, and Marcus Licinius Crassus commanded control of most of Roman politics. Adding to her advantage in being the niece of Caesar was the fact that Attia's father, Marcus Attius Balbus, was the son of Pompeius Magnus's aunt Pompeia. In marrying Attia Balbus Sonia, Philippus established family ties with two-thirds of the triumvirate. And through his daughter, Marcia, Philippus claimed as his son-in-law, Marcus Portius Cato, leader of the Boni. He further strengthened his alliance with the Boni when he agreed to the divorce of Marcia so that she could marry the orator Quintus Hortensius Hortulus. With one foot in Caesar's camp, another foot in the Pompeian camp, and a hand in the camp of the Boni, Lucius Martius Philippus was politically quite well situated. When civil war broke out between Caesar and Pompeius Magnus, senators who fled to Greece were deemed Pompeians, and those who remained in Rome were considered Caesarians. Lucius Martius Philippus did neither. Taking his wife and stepson, Philippus withdrew to Naples, where he awaited notification of the civil war's outcome. After defeating Pompeius Magnus at Pharsalus, Caesar wrote to Philippus, praising him for his political neutrality. Caesar then appointed the young Gaius Octavius to the vacancy within the College of Pontiffs that had been created by the death of Lucius Domitius Enobarbus at Pharsalus. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC, Gaius Octavius was approximately 14 years old. Like most teenagers who romanticized the virtues of war, Octavius desperately wanted to fight on behalf of his great uncle. He begged his mother to allow him to join the campaign in Numidia, which was led by Caesar's man Gaius Rebonius Curio, and which had ended in the death of Curio and in the annihilation of his legions. Although we are told that it was his overprotective mother, Attia, who prevented Octavius from going to Numidia, 
it seems far more likely that the decision was influenced by Philippus, careful to keep Octavius neutral to protect him from execution should Caesar not win the civil war. By 46 BC, when Gaius Octavius again wanted to fight for Caesar against the last of the Pompeians in Hispania, a fight which had culminated in the Battle of Munda, the political situation had drastically changed. Pompeius Magnus had been murdered in Egypt. Marcus Licinius Crassus had fallen at the Battle of Cari. Cato and Metellus Scipio had committed suicide. Caesar was the lone survivor among the triumvirs, now named dictator for ten years. At the age of fifty-four, and after three marriages, Caesar still had no son. As potential heirs, Gaius Octavius, along with cousins Quintus Pedius and Lucius Panarius, were becoming very important. With the very last of the Pompeians making their final stand in Hispania, now was the perfect time for Philippus to encourage Octavius to go to war. One cousin, Quintus Pedius, was already serving as legate to Caesar. Octavius needed the chance to make a good impression, rather than disappear in the shadow of Quintus Pedius. However, there was always the possibility that the Pompeians might win the war, and Caesar might be defeated. Once again we are told that the overprotective Attia delayed Octavius's departure for Hispania, pleading illness. When Octavius recovered and finally departed Rome, he met the fate of shipwreck along Hispania's coast, where together with a few survivors who swam ashore, he crossed hostile Pompeian territory on foot to arrive at Caesar's camp only after the decisive Battle of Munda had seen Caesar the clear winner. On his journey back to Rome, Caesar shared his carriage with Gaius Octavius, and the two talked away long hours. Once back in Rome, among the many honors and titles that were bestowed on Caesar, the month of his birth was renamed in his honor. Because the calendar, which Caesar had reorganized with the help of Sosigenes of Alexandria, belonged in the realm of religion, the renaming of the month of Quintilis to Julius or July would have originated within the College of Pontiffs, to which Octavius now belonged. Before the end of the year, Gaius Octavius departed Rome again, this time under orders from his uncle. Caesar, during his triumph, appointment of offices, and reconstruction of the Forum Romanum, was also busy raising new legions for an upcoming military action planned against Dasha. The Dacians had begun attacking and raiding in the Roman province of Illyricum thirteen years earlier, when Caesar had appropriated the brunt of Illyricum's legions for his invasion of Gaul, thus weakening Illyricum's defences against Dacia. Now, to bolster the fighting power of the Roman province, Caesar was giving Gaius Octavius watch over six newly raised legions. So Gaius Octavius set out for the town of Apollonia, where he was to undergo his military training in preparation. It would be his responsibility to ensure against interference by any who opposed Caesar. Despite sharing the glory of his Hispania triumph with his nephew Quintus Pedius, and even presenting the recently forgiven Marcus Antonius' pride of place in his Munda triumph, Caesar had someone else in mind when he visited the Temple of Vesta near the end of the 45 BC year. There, he deposited a new will naming Gaius Octavius as his primary heir. Although Caesar kept this change to his last will and testament secret, on December 19 of the same year, he made a trip to the town of Puteoli, where Lucius Martius Philippus owned a summer villa. With only Caesar's personal secretary, Lucius Cornelius Balbus, in attendance, Caesar and Philippus talked privately for hours. According to Cicero, when they concluded their meeting, Caesar was in high good humor. Even as dictator, Caesar could not bequeath his governmental powers to an heir, although the gravitas associated with his name could be extremely valuable in that heir's attempts at public office. But a step farther to Gaius Octavius, Philippus could be assured that Caesar's many estates and vast profits from Gaul, Britannia, and Egypt were secured for the future of Gaius Octavius, whatever that future held. As a show of good faith, Philippus's eponymously named son from his first marriage was appointed by Caesar to the office of praetor for the 44 BC year. But Caesar needed absolute discretion from Philippus. Octavius could not know. No one could. Caesar was not oblivious to the fact that so many saw themselves as his potential heirs. 
and Gaius Octavius was too young to possess the maturity that might guarantee Caesar the loyalty of the legions he committed to the young man, considering they answered first to Caesar and then to Marcus Antonius. Caesar needed time to groom his young nephew and train him in politics. Time for the legions to come around, time for Gaius Octavius to develop his own following, and time for Caesar to gradually reveal to the public his plans to adopt Gaius Octavius. It would not have been difficult for Lucius Martius Philippus, a master of political perception, to evaluate the potential in having a stepson who would one day inherit Caesar's fabulous fortune and the loyalty of so many legions. But for the most part, Philippus saw political gold in being stepfather to Rome's future Caesar 